The final topic that we look at that relates to requirement one of the battery management system is that of thermal control. And this is not a major focus of the specialization, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but there are some important and relevant points to mention, and that's what this lesson is all about. The temperature of a battery pack has some fairly significant impacts on safety as well as on the lifetime of the battery pack. Generally, lithium ion battery cells last longest if they're maintained in the temperature band from about 10 degrees Celsius to about 40 degrees Celsius during use. A good rule of thumb is that if you as a human being are comfortable at a particular temperature, then the battery pack is also comfortable at that temperature. In other words, if you feel too cold, then it's probably too cold for the battery pack to perform well. If you feel too hot, then it's probably too hot for the battery pack as well. The battery pack can certainly survive colder and warmer temperatures, uh, but you get the maximum performance and the maximum life out of the battery pack if you maintain it in that kind of a temperature band. The figure uh, on the left of the slide illustrates the safe operating window of lithium ion battery cells as a function of cell voltage and of temperature. On the horizontal axis you see cell voltage. The safe operating range is going to be different for lithium ion cells of different chemistries, but this is generally between about maybe a little over 2 volts up to maybe a little over 4 volts. The vertical axis is temperature in degrees Celsius. And the safe operating window extends maybe from about negative 30 degrees Celsius up to about 60 degrees Celsius on this axis. Again, there are some variations depending on how the cell is manufactured and what additives are placed in the electrolyte and some different things like that. But roughly speaking, this is the safe operating window of lithium ion cells in general. If the cell voltage becomes too low, then the current collector on the negative electrode begins dissolving into the electrolyte. And remember that this is a copper foil, and so copper from this current collector dissolves into positively charged copper ions in the electrolyte. And uh, these try to compete with the positively charged lithium ions in the electrolyte to cycle back and forth through the battery cell, uh, just as the lithium does. Now these copper ions are usually too large to intercalate into the active materials of either electrode, and so instead they plate metallic copper onto the surface of the electrodes. And this causes a metallic annealing site to form, and once one of these sites has formed, it's easier for other copper or lithium, uh, any other trace metals that are in the electrolyte to form on this annealing site and to make long, thin metallic dendrites that can grow and grow across the separator and cause a short circuit between the two electrodes of this cell. So worst case, under voltage can lead to short circuits and to thermal runaway. On the other hand, if I overcharge a battery cell, that can cause positive electrode breakdown. Remember that when we charge a cell, lithium moves out of the positive electrode, and remember that in some electrodes there's this layered crystal structure that can collapse if too much lithium is removed. So overcharging causes material breakdown in this electrode and, and quite severe capacity loss. If I overcharge a battery cell at cold temperatures, lithium comes out uh, of the electrolyte in ionic form and will actually plate solid metallic lithium onto the surface of the negative electrode. It's called lithium plating. Uh, this removes lithium from circulation, so it causes capacity loss, and it also causes dendrites to form and can lead to short circuits as well. Those are some of the primary causes. They can also lead to secondary effects. For example, if I overcharge a battery, it can lead to temperature rise, and that itself can cause the solid electrolyte interface layer, a film layer that grows in the negative electrode particles to passivate them to break down and expose fresh graphite to the solvent in the electrolyte, which causes more solid electrolyte interface layer to grow. And this reduces the amount of cyclable lithium and decreases the capacity of the battery cell. And just the very act of this uh, formation and growth of SEI, the solid electrolyte interface, can cause temperature rise. And so temperature rise causes SEI growth, which causes temperature rise, and you see that we're having a problem. At some point, the separator can melt, and this could lead to short circuits between the negative and the positive electrode particles, and that 
short circuit causes large amounts of current to flow, which causes additional temperature rise. This can cause the electrolyte to begin to break down and to form gases and to build up pressure inside the cell. Some of these gases are flammable, and if they're released to the environment, um, if the cell packaging fails, that can lead to external fires also. Uh, as temperature increases, uh, this possibility of venting increases, and um, and the, the problem is getting worse and worse. You can tell it's accelerating. The cathode materials, the positive electrode materials, often contain enough oxygen. They're, they're generally oxides, and there's enough oxygen in the material itself that once a, uh, a fire has started, that the fire is uh, self-sustaining. And even in a vacuum, the, the, the cell will continue to burn because of the oxygen uh, that is in the, the positive electrode. And this is a condition called thermal runaway and must be avoided at all costs. Uh, so it's also worth noting that it's not only the maximum or minimum temperature of the battery pack that matters, it's also important to keep a relatively uniform temperature across all of the cells of the battery pack. Uh, aging, the rate of aging depends on the temperature locally, and so if I want the battery pack to age in a uniform way, all of the cells should have very similar temperatures. If some cells turn out to age more quickly than others, then some will become weaker than the others. And it's usually the weakest cell in the battery pack that limits performance rather than, for example, the average cell in the battery pack. So even if all of your cells are in fantastic health except for one, that one weak cell will limit what your battery pack is able to do. Keeping cells at uniform temperatures also helps to maintain consistency, and so this battery pack will not be limited by only one weak cell. Two different methods are commonly used to cool a battery pack. Um, one is forced air cooling, where fans can direct air across the battery cells in order to cool them. And the other is liquid cooling, where some thermally conductive liquid is run through pipes or plates right uh, right up next to the cells to remove heat from them. Uh, if the battery pack is used at relatively low rates, then air cooling may be sufficient. But if the battery pack routinely sees high power demand, then it will need a more aggressive cooling strategy to remove this heat uh, because the heat is generated at a faster rate. It might not seem intuitive, but electric vehicles generally need less cooling per cell than hybrid electric vehicles. And this is because electric vehicles are designed for energy applications for long-range applications. So each cell is discharged at a relatively low rate and therefore generates heat at a relatively low rate as well per cell. Hybrid electric vehicles have essentially zero electric range and it and they're designed only to provide the peak power demand, and so power is drawn from cells at a relatively high rate per cell, generating heat at a faster rate as well. So again, that analysis is per cell, so you have to do the math to come up with the aggregate heat generation to see whether liquid cooling is required or whether air cooling is sufficient. The two photographs on this slide show cutaways of two vehicles. The vehicle on the top is the extended range electric vehicle, the Chevy Volt, and the vehicle on the bottom is the Tesla Model S. Both of these vehicles use uh, liquid thermal management. In uh, the Chevy Volt, the battery pack sits behind uh, between rather the, the driver's seat and the passenger seat in the front of the vehicle, and it runs down the center of the vehicle between the passenger seats and the rear, and then splits off and makes a T-shape and is behind the passenger seats in the rear. And in this design, there are plates inserted between cells uh, in the battery pack, and these plates have thin, tiny channels in them through which the liquid is pumped to remove the heat generated by the cells. In the Tesla Model S, the battery pack is located in the floor underneath the entire passenger compartment, and liquid is passed in between the cells in this region to cool them. In some cases, it may actually turn out to be advantageous to implement heating in addition to cooling. If we have the ability to heat a battery pack, then we can charge the pack even if the ambient temperature is quite low because we can cause the temperature of the battery pack itself can be warm enough to charge without risk of lithium plating and damage even though the outside temperature is cold. 
Notice that the biggest reason we might want to heat a battery pack is to enable charging, and so heating will be done probably only when the, the battery pack, the vehicle, is plugged in to the utilities grid, and so we're not wasting battery pack energy to heat the battery pack. Instead, we're using the utilities energy in order to heat the battery pack. Also, because of the resistance of the battery cells, as I'm charging and discharging, even a cold battery pack tends to heat up fairly quickly, so this is why cooling is um, more important than heating, usually. In some cases, we may also wish to cool the battery pack below ambient temperature. Air cooling and liquid cooling exchange heat with the environment and so are able to bring the battery pack temperature down no further than the ambient temperature. But instead, if we use some kind of a refrigerant in our cooling system, then it's possible to cool the battery pack below the temperature of the environment. This is going to require significant energy, and so it may not be a good idea when the vehicle is in operation because we're using the energy from the battery pack to do so. But if the vehicle is parked and the vehicle is plugged in to the utilities grid, then it can be a good idea because it can bring the temperature of the battery cells down into a more healthy range and extend the life of the battery pack. In the United States, one of the cities that's often used as a benchmark is Phoenix, Arizona. If you've been there in the summer, you understand why. Phoenix uh, has very elevated temperatures in the summer. And a vehicle not operating simply parked on the pavement encounters really extreme temperatures, even up to 50 or 60 degrees Celsius just parked. And so I think you can see why the ability to refrigerate the battery pack when the vehicle is stationary might be a, a good thing to do in that situation. So to summarize this very short lesson, you've learned that it's important to keep the battery cells in a comfortable temperature range to ensure safety and to extend the battery pack's life. It's also important to keep the cells at a uniform temperature so that they will age at a consistent rate. And this has the side benefit of reducing the need for many temperature sensors since we can quite safely assume that the temperatures of most cells are relatively the same. In present commercial automotive battery packs, uh, we either have air cooling or liquid cooling. There are some reports that range in life are negatively impacted by air-cooled systems since the air cooling is not as effective as liquid cooling. Liquid cooling systems are more expensive, but they're able to extract more heat at a faster rate than air-cooled systems are able to do. Active heating and active cooling while the vehicle is plugged into the utilities grid can extend life and can also shorten charge times, especially if the ambient temperature is cold by bringing the temperature of the battery pack into a range that will enable faster charging. And finally, I remind you that the focus of the specialization really has to do with designing algorithms for battery management systems. The focus is not on the thermal management uh, system of the vehicle. And in fact, the thermal management system is an enormous design challenge, and you could probably have an entire specialization simply on that topic, but I'll leave that up to someone else to develop who's an expert in that area. So that brings us to an end of this lesson and an end to the major topic areas of this week. The remaining lesson is a summary lesson that that uh, looks at what you've learned and looks ahead to the topics that we're going to look at next week.